Okay, so on to our next fireside chat now. Um, eyes on Indus Valley. So unlike Silicon Valley, which has a geographic connotation, um, Indus Valley represents the entire um, Indian startup ecosystem. And our next guest is the author of the seminal playbook, the Indus Valley Playbook. So join us now as Sajid Pai, director of Bloom Ventures, sits in conversation with Mujtaba Vani of GSV Ventures to, think how, to, to discuss how he thinks this playbook will unfold. Welcome uh, Mujtaba and Sajid. Hi folks, thank you for joining us uh, for this session on Indus Valley. My name is Mujtaba Wani. I'm a principal at GSV and drive uh, our India investments. Um, Sajid was one of the first people I met when we started looking seriously at India in summer 2020. Uh, and to kick us off, I'll ask Sajid just to tell us a little bit about himself. I'm sure you probably see his posts on LinkedIn, on Twitter. He has a sub stack, uh, but you know, most VCs tweet 140 characters, not a lot of them write 7,000 words. Uh, you know, Sajid, some people think he was a journalist because he worked at Times beforehand, but that's not exactly true. But I'll, I'll hand it to him to tell us a little bit about his journey in becoming an investor. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Mujtaba. Uh, so, uh, I'm a fairly unusual entrant into venture. When I joined Bloom, um, we're a seed fund. Uh, we invest fairly early. In the space of edtech, we're known for our uh, early investments into an academy, class plus leverage. Uh, and when I joined uh, Bloom, I was 43. I didn't have prior startup experience or venture. So it's fairly uh, unusual hire. I like to kind of think of myself as an accidental venture capitalist. Uh, but I'd done enough, I think. Um, in the Times Group, I'd helped set up a channel. Uh, I'd helped set up a university. And uh, Karthik Reddy, uh, the founder of Bloom, and who and I had worked together briefly at times, thought uh, I would make for a reasonably good VC, and uh, here I am. So that's sort of my story. But yet, I think the uh, journey won't be complete. You mentioned about my writing, and I think writing's what got me noticed. Uh, writing's what kept me uh, kind of active. And I sort of have this, I think, hyphenated identity around like a writer investor. And I think uh, I've always done well when I've brought in some of that thesis thinking lens into investments. And uh, my writing is a better because I invest. So that's sort of a little bit about me. I hope kind of uh, gives folks uh, kind of a sense of what I am, who I am. But yeah, happy to double click. And so we'll start today by talking about your 7,000 word piece on Indus Valley, uh, which is summarized well on this slide. But I think this was a piece that really made a splash. And you know, if, if you look up or you talk to any investor who was interested in India, and now I just, I just send them this article and tell them to start here. But it's a really helpful way of just understanding the history of Indian tech ecosystem startups. And it'd be great if you could just explain it to us. Yeah, I will. Yeah, so, uh, this article came out, I think, in, the, in 2020. Um, and uh, last year, uh, there was a report called the Indus Valley uh, annual report. We'll update it soon. Uh, Indus Valley is sort of a pun on uh, Silicon Valley, right? Uh, so, uh, and sort of this chart kind of tells you a little bit about the evolution. Uh, and sort of, I saw four distinct phases. Uh, the first phase really was this long phase till about, I would say, the mid knots when uh, I think the investments that really worked were really uh, software services, right? And all of the big successes in venture capital and startup world came primarily from software services, like Mastec, Kale, Mindtree, uh, were all uh, venture-backed investments. Uh, venture, as we know, it started in the mid-aughts, um, and uh, that's where you have some of the names that I mentioned, Nokri.com, Redbus, et cetera. This is really people saying, hey, you want to buy tickets, do it over the internet. It's just a slightly better business model. And uh, it, it worked. 
then came the era of not just services online, but products online. And that's the era of Flipkart, delivery, uh, Baiju's kind of began then, uh, and uh, all of uh, the big transaction models really came up then. And around 16, mobile phones, geo, uh, all of that happened. Uh, UPI, all of that happened. And sort of what I call uh, in the article, action, the, the report rather, I mentioned something called the Wang trifecta, which is really uh, sort of three things need to happen for an economy or a consumer internet to take off in a country, which is uh, ultra cheap bandwidth, a frictionless payment system, and a mobile phone in every pocket. And that's what happened in India in 16, 17. And I call it Wang Trafficta because Tony Wang of Agora, uh, the CF told me about it. He said this thing happened in China in, in the late aughts. And that's when the Chinese economy took off. Great. So that's sort of the history of this. I, I mean, again, I can go into it. But if you look at it, there are hero startups uh, in, in, in sort of every era. And uh, the hero startups of this era of the era that started in 16, fundamentally used the mobile and the mobile UI as a springboard to both acquire and, 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 and help the customer navigate and to the transaction. I'm of course glossing over, I haven't covered B2B, et cetera, here. And we can of course go into it if you want, but I think this gives you a kind of a distinct idea, really. So the one thing I think would be interesting for this audience to go a level deeper on these companies and, and this topic is, Today in Indian ed tech, are we actually talking about product companies or are we talking about services companies? Mm. Mm. So I think, uh, I think it's a great question uh, because I think increasingly, I think one successful strain of ed tech companies is certainly, I would say, I mean, I don't know if product is the right word for it, but they are processization companies, right? It's sort of uh, the, like leverage, for example, in our uh, thing. They take a process which has got a lot of friction and uh, kind of put a, add a product to it, but product is not necessarily the hero layer. It's an entire provision of services around it. Uh, I think great ed tech plays fundamentally have a strong services element baked into it, okay? Uh, whether it's Emeritus, who's sort of the sponsor here, uh, whether it's Baiju's, who's increasingly running classrooms now. And I think uh, intrinsically, the best, most successful, the largest companies will be a combination of product and services, I think. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the answer. Were you looking for that answer? Uh, yeah? No, th that's helpful. I mean, maybe just while we're on it, do you want to talk about uh, adding a commerce angle, right? Like class pluses really a, a started as a product company, right? Class Plus started as a SaaS platform, but it's gone into becoming kind of an e-commerce platform. Yeah. Well, I think really one of the challenges that all Indian startups have, ed tech specifically is, and I think uh, it's, sort of the repu uh, it's sort of the thesis I'm kind of well known for, that there is a smallish uh, consumer engine in India, and I think of it as, and we'll come to it, I think Zindia One, which is about uh, 120 million people, and fundamentally, all of the big spends uh, really come through, uh, yeah, in fact, yeah, maybe just one more slide after this. Yeah, so sort of uh, uh, the stack, this is what we think of it, a consumer stack. So this India One, which is really the consumer engine of India, uh, is really where a lot of the spending is concentrated. They are about 10% but of India accounts for about 40% of spends, uh, think of it as a Mexico, really, that kind of per capita income, that kind of population. Hidden within that is what I call India One Alpha, which is sort of a Taiwan within India, which is 25 million people, 8 million households, $35,000 per capita income, people like us, everyone in this room, etc. right? So increasingly, when you outgrow this segment, you find that the monetization doesn't go off the way you want it. You can't really keep going. So what happens is, now you've taken in all the venture dollars from a lot of the investors over here, and who are saying, great, like you're like growing gangbusters. And then suddenly when you hit like the limits of India one, uh, you're not scaling as fast. For example, Zomato for the last uh, four quarters has been stuck at this 15, 17 million monthly active users. They're not able to go beyond that. Uh, Nika, they're like at 12 million. They're not able to kind of go beyond that, right? 
Maybe they will, okay? So I think what happens is then you need to layer on all of this, what I told you, you need to layer on services. So when an academy says, hey, we this great product company out of Bangalore, but now we're going to run uh, like large tuition shops in Kota. Uh, Class Plus says SaaS alone won't take us to uh, like a billion dollar valuation, which is what people like you and me want. But hey, so we're going to layer on commerce. Some of them are able to pull it off well and create interesting models. So Class Plus is one of them. Others are a little more inelegant, but like, but they seem to get the jobs done. Uh, so this is really, I think, the fundamental challenge that most Indian startups have. You do very well early on, like selling into India one. Then you get all the dollars. People look at you and say, "Oh, we're going to sell into India two and India three too." And then you find, "Oh." What made you succeed in India 1 is not what necessarily is going to make you succeed in India 2. You need very distinct hooks into the India 2 landmass. You need the hooks that a share chat has. You need the hooks like YouTube has. You need the hooks like a Misho has. And maybe that's, maybe even that's not enough, right? But yeah, I think that's sort of the challenge that Indians have, which is why you see these very interesting, distinct India models that emerge. So, yeah. How do you think about how founder background founder DNA plays into this? Like, like, do you think a founder from India 1 can build for India 3? You know, never say never, and I'm probably going to get hated on by a lot of founders. But I think the best founders understand uh, their DNA, their ethos, uh, their unique worldviews, and uh, they're able to kind of uh, understand their strengths and double down on those strengths. So like a Kunal Shah, we're chatting about it. Uh, he's building a India 1A, possibly half of India 1A business, right? Like, and he doesn't care about, I mean, he has a very distinct worldview, okay? But he understands what succeeds in India 1A. It's not necessarily, it's not easy to do an India 1 plus India 2 business. So I would say, it, I, come to think of it, I think you can, Okay, I'm not saying you can't, but I haven't seen too many examples of it. Uh, each of these journeys is tough. India 1 to India 1 plus 2 is tough. India 2 to India 1 plus 2 is even tougher. Misho is trying it. Uh, all the best to them. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. I mean, the Kunal Shah example is really interesting, right? Because he, he's on, in his interviews, he's extremely clear that he is not building for the masses. It's not in his product's capacity. Uh, and it's nice, nice focus actually. Yeah, he, he, he calls it a power law business and uh, recently tweeted about, uh, I did, about 3-4% um, about of Zomato's users responsible for like 30-40% of sales or transactions and uh, he DM'd me saying that, yeah, that's great, India is a power law country. Uh, yeah, he's also tweeted that five, six million people in India, and uh, I don't know if it's the right thing to be saying at this conference about India, but what you're saying about five, six million consumers in India are responsible for like 50% of, uh, you're going to call me back, right, after this, yeah, yeah? next year, you will, right, yeah, F uh, five, six million consumers in, uh, in kind of responsible for 50, 60% of e-commerce sales in India, so that's, it's, it's a very polarized, it's a, it's, it's a very power law-led kind of country. And uh, I think you need to understand that very, very deeply. Yeah. So in, in the session before we came on, uh, Pratik Maheshwari from, from Physics Wallet was on. Obviously, that's a company that we're investors in that has made massive headways in education outside of India 1. Just, you know, what are you seeing? Do you see other companies being successful in being able to do that in education? Do you see that as feasible white space? I think so. I think, I mean, I've been understood, I haven't done a lot of deep reading into PW, but I think one of the reasons they succeeded is I didn't think they had a lot of venture-backed money going into them, and they were able to kind of quietly build out a very unique, distinct model, and leveraging his personal brand as much. But you're fundamentally going around saying, what got you here won't take you there. And you're saying, now we're going to give you a lot more money. Now you've got to expand 20x. Mm. So, uh, so all the best to him. And I think he's an inspiring founder. And there's a lot, uh, I think, Indian ethic founders in general can learn from Alok and Pratik. Yeah. So, uh, but I think those sort of plays are a lot more harder. What he's done is impressive. And I'm not saying that others can't do it. 
but sort of he had the luxury of being able to grow a little slowly and build out this distinct model without focusing a lot on venture money. So with venture money, how will that change? It'll be interesting to watch. I'd love to kind of see how they kind of grow from here. I mean, it's a, it was a distribution first business, right? He was a personal brand and a YouTube channel before a company, before uh, a startup, certainly way before raising funding. Um, do, do you have a view on those, on those models and how that, how that is yeah. going to shape? In general, I feel um, those, those two kind of uh, uh, models, right? You can start product first, like, a, like, like an unacademy. I think it's a classic play. Uh, or you can start like distribution first, like, but, like PW, class close is another example. And then try and add on a layer uh, into, of, of product or content into it. I kind of like the latter more. So I like the PWs, the class pluses a lot more because I, uh, I feel, uh, I think the harder thing in India, India is a, uh, is a country where, I mean, GTM matters. Uh, I'm not saying product doesn't matter, don't get me wrong, but I think product is great, but GTM is what really uh, kind of uh, like, like makes or breaks you. And I think uh, startups which are distribution first, which sort of have an in into the consumer, and, uh, and are sort of like a pipe into the consumer, are able to kind of then stack or stuff that pipe with relevant content, product, et cetera, I think intrinsically make for a slightly better model. The faster you take your product to the customer, I think fundamentally, I think the challenge, real challenge in India is not that, it, it, building a viable business model at scale of being able to systematically acquire a large number of consumers cheaply, serve them cheaply, with good margins and keep growing that, it's not easy, okay? I'm not saying it can't be done, it's not easy. So it's easy to be this great tuition shop which is half a million dollars revenue, 250K in cash, you can drive an Audi, all of an academy's educators are like that. But scaling that into a 20X, 30X revenue company, that, that's hard. So in India, I think faster you kind of go to the consumer, get your GTM right and know what can you get from the consumer then you can work backwards to see how much do I then acquire the customer for. Whereas with product, you clearly don't know as much. You're, you're, you're doing hide and you, you, you're testing out continuously. Can I charge this? Can I charge that? Meanwhile, your product costs are high, right? Because they're spread over a very narrow base of customers. So I think that's the challenge in India, I think, fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, all, so all these companies we've talked about, with the exception of Class Plus, are content companies as well. Yeah. And do you see that as an issue to scale, to getting these economics right? Huh. I think uh, I'm not averse to like a content company, so investing in content companies, but I want a faster testing of what customers are willing to pay. And I think with content companies, there isn't as much focus, a product companies rather, product first companies, because founders clearly come into the play because they want to build great products, right? No founder says, I want to sit and talk to parents. Founders are like, hey, let's get these three engineers together. Let's layer on this AI tool. Let's layer on this UI. Oh, wow, look at this product. It's so beautiful. Look at the screen. It's like butter smooth. That's what gets them excited. The moment they say, okay, we'll do research. We'll talk to parents. They're saying, oh my God, like, you know, but I think fundamentally the faster you're able to do that, I think, I think, I think, I think the better it is. And I'm not saying you can't start from product. There are so many great companies which start from product. And uh, we'll kind of, uh, kind of move into that thing. But the faster you're able to kind of get what the customers say, what the customers are willing to pay, I think the better it is. That's sort of the way I would put it, yeah. When we first at GSV started looking at seriously investing in India, meeting companies, meeting uh, folks like yourself who were investors, who were experts, uh, one thing people told us was, Indians aren't willing to pay for products and aren't willing to pay for subscriptions. They'll pay for courses. And, you know, there were many companies with great uh, user traction like Hello English and some of these other product first plays, but they were unable to successfully monetize or scale monetization. Do you think that'll change or do you think that's how it will remain? Sorry, I just want you to double click. Uh, I just want you to double click a little more. I didn't get the first part of the question. Yeah. That will will Indian consumers pay for just a product? Like a consumer sub, oh. like a Duolingo premium yeah. subscription? Um, so keep in mind that India is a country with per capita income of $2,450. It used to be 2K for a long time stuck there. Now I think it was 
Yes, India 1 is at 10K per capita, but India 2 is like 3K, right? Yeah. So, um, I think you're better off in India if you understand that the customer's job to be done is to fundamentally use the product that you've created to get outcomes, to get into the college of their choice or to get a job. Uh, which is why, uh, so add or what, do whatever is mandated, right? So you fundamentally, three great business models in India. So the first great business model is running a profitable school and schools are very good businesses, right? Which is why there's a huge m and market in schools. Two, test prep. The most profitable Indian companies hitherto have been test prep companies, physical test prep companies, well run, well run oil, oil machines out of Kota, uh, or uh, South India, which is in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, but uh, increasingly what your Baijus and all are trying to do is mimic that model, right? And the third uh, great uh, model is uh, employability education, which is I think Emeritus runs a very good business. I'm very impressed with them, not because they're sponsors, but yeah, but yeah. But uh, increasingly we've started looking at that space very keenly. And I think employability education is something that's of deep interest to us as well. And our recent bet, Virohan, in that space has been inspired by that. And uh, Virohan, of course, is far more blue collar compared to Emeritus, which is digital white collar. But health care education, which helps give you those operating theater attendance or nursing attendance. I think we, we, we really see a very, very large TAM uh, kind of there. So that's sort of what I meant. I hope that's clear. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks, Sajid. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Mushtaba. Thank you, Mushtaba and Sajid. Um, great takeaway that founders need to focus on uh, customer needs and not products. Thank you for a great session. Thank you.